Hello everybody, we are Possessive from Boise, Idaho. I'm Rutger, I do all the drums and vocals. I'm Corey, I play bass and do uh, some noise. And I'm Marco, everyone calls me Chubbs. I do guitars and also handle some noise. We have been playing in Possessive since 2015. Uh, a couple years later, Corey joined the band and has just been a solid uh, third member. It originally started as a two-piece kind of power violence, uh, black metal project. Um, and now having Corey in the band has given it that low end. Uh, he's on our first album, of course, and uh, all of us have, are on the new album that's about to come out on Bruccia Records. Uh, possessive really wants the name to kind of speak for itself. So the second album is titled Red Ipsa Loquitur, and that's Latin for the thing speaks for itself. And that's really the concept behind the second album is listening to it, uh, the feelings behind the different harsh noise, uh, D-beat, black metal, things like that, that really uh, let the album kind of speak for itself. Uh, and uh, of course, um, doing drums and playing vocals, it's uh, all a lot about the uh, experience of the live performance. Um, so the uh, concept really is trying to be as fucking heavy as possible while also having a lot of um, influences from power violence to D-beat, black metal, and really being able to play with all those types of bands. Um, so that yeah, uh, <clears throat> Body Void, Primitive Man are definitely some people that we've played with, and these are people that we very much look up to as well. Yeah, and the album was just kind of born of, I think two of the songs were written at the end of the writing session of the last album cycle, and so we really wanted to record these and have some other material that was indicative of where we were at the time but it was all a collaborative effort i think we would show up with ideas and then all of us together would agree like yeah this needs to be this long it needs to be this loud it needs to be this heavy or whatever but there's also a lot of moments of space and i think that that's super important or like breath there's a lot of breath in the album and you know we maybe we made some choices that aren't like popular for like a metal band like there's not really like guitar solos there's more like space solos so it just that was kind of the concept of the album but the whole possessive thing being like you hear it going on and especially live it's like you can't really can't really ignore it it just kind of takes over time and space in front of you and uh let's just say i hope you brought earplugs kind of thing yeah yeah hell yeah The writing process that we use, uh, it's all over the place. This second album uh, was more of a collaborative effort between all three of us. I would say the, uh, as far as like the first album was concerned, it was a lot of me and Chubbs and Corey kind of in the practice space and um, just like really hashing out different D beat riffs and not really focusing on anything except for what sounds heavy, what sounds cool, and then also not going into, you'll hear on the first album a lot, there's not really 4-4 four, four measures or um, measures of 8. Uh, you'll hear more sections of 3s, 5s, and 7s, odd numbers, really spacing it out and giving it that uh, less of a uh, cookie cutter feel. <clears throat> I'd say on the new album coming out on Bruccia, the uh, songs we wanted to do some more mid-tempo songs uh, definitely some slower and heavier songs but you'll feel um, you know right as we go lightning fast and like d-beat there's a lot of power violence influence um, so the writing process was really all over the place but uh, very collaborative we really kind of hear it i'll hear a riff that Corey or chubbs will play and i'm like that's a riff we got to keep that riff or 
we'll kind of put some drums to it and shape it. And uh, maybe one practice it sounds in this structure, and the next time we come to practice, even though we've maybe recorded it, um, it's, it's a little different, and we kind of shape them and really build the song. So like Chubbs was saying, so much breath in each one of those uh, songs, as well as just trying to have a little bit more dynamic. Yeah, and there was like a few ideas that we had recorded via voice recorder on our phones, and we kind of sifted through kind of the best of some of the ideas to find the ones that we felt like were more just of the theme and kind of were like, yeah, this is the right thing. But there's definitely several recordings in our phones, and we cycled through and kind of went back and forth and would send them to each other and be like, yeah, this part was cool from that one. Let's take that part and put it in another song. But so very much just kind of like at our discretion things that we all kind of felt like were were the sound for this second release i think also doing drums and vocals at the same time i have to be considerate of where my endurance is live and how much i can really put into um uh, you know 40 minute or an hour long set because uh, uh if, when you do an instrument and do vocals at the same time especially something like drums you really have to uh your, your vocals are shaped around how you're playing the drums. So that's one thing in the writing process with the vocals and the lyrics is, on the first album I really, I went into the studio and kind of did the vocals more separate. And this album, th then going to play that more live, it was a lot more difficult to do the vocals and the drums live, having done them separately in the studio this time around it was more what vocals are going to feel good in these spot in these spots when i'm playing live so you'll really feel a lot more like low end vocals um and uh it keeps the uh the speed and endurance for like when i do need to go fast um so we try and consider that in the writing process like do the vocals fit and um, if they uh can they be done properly while we're playing um, live especially the live experience we do like a ton of fog uh, love fog machines we do a ton of uh, red deep warm lighting so like orange and red have typically been the themes and then we have um, it's just super atmospheric um, you know the title of the band and like what Chubbs was saying the idea you know you can't ignore it when you're hearing it live it has a very specific vibe, for lack of a better term. Yeah. <laughs> I use the Jackson 7 string. I've been using that 7 string for this project, and that was what we wrote all of the Possessive One material on. We like full stacks. I like a full stack. I like to run a wet, dry rig. But it was that Jackson 7 string on this recording and a Strandberg 8 string um, tuned to that 7 string. The main distortion sound was a JHS Clover just slamming the preamp, not really using amp distortion in the traditional sense, but like making the tubes work to where it sounded like they were screaming and, and definitely kind of an offensive sound. And I've been told that by a lot of sound guys, but it's, you know, I gotta have the full stack and I run one just regular distorted, one with all the effects for the noise stuff I really like. Stuff by Chase Bliss, stuff by Hologram Electronics. And uh, yeah, but that's all coming through my guitar rig and we do use other tools, which Corey will tell you about those, that help provide additional noise that are kind of beyond the scope of what you would traditionally see in a guitar rig. But that's, that's kind of the gear that I would use. <clears throat> Yeah, as far as what I use to my bass and everything, it's pretty standard stuff. I do use a couple distortion pedals. Um, can't give all the secrets away with the noise, but uh, I'll I'll let you know that Behringer Wasp is, yeah, I love is involved, that thing. and um, also I have a. Uh, Maximal Drone from uh, Tucci. Was it? Tucci Instruments. Tucci, I think. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think so. You play a six string bass. Yes. 
It's a no name base, but it, you make that thing. It's Douglas. Good. Douglas. I almost looked that up. I I don't know if you can even buy one of those. One of a kind. As far as uh, drums are concerned, I've kind of switched in and out between some vintage kits. I have a uh, 1976 Ludwig natural finish. Uh, that one has all birch shells. Then I also have a Maple Tama Grand Star. It's from the 80s. The vintage drum sounds I really like. The, um, the thing about drums though is it's really about how you mic them. Um, so I really feel like you know, as far as snare is concerned, I have a Ludwig Black Magic. It's a 14 by six and a half. That thing is really deep. Really has like a rifle sound to it, which I love. Uh, my symbols of choice are Minel. I like the Byzance or MB20. They don't really make those anymore. You'll hear the ride that I use is the uh, pure metal ride. It's 24 inches. That thing is just a beast. I've had it for uh, 15 years now hasn't failed me and same thing with the hi-hats a mb20 um, bronze but they're 15 inch hi-hats and gives it that like hissing snake sound that i really really like and then as far as gear is concerned um, i'll use any old mic but i do like my uh, tc helicon uh, pedal that gives me that the vocal echo a little bit of reverb uh, some wetness to it i got like that cavernous feel to the vocals we haven't dipped really into like in-ear monitors or anything like that. We all really like the live feel and sound. Um, and sometimes depending on the stage, the bigger the stage, the harder it is to feel that, uh, that really intense uh, on stage, uh, I don't know, power. And so um, we do prefer like a little bit of a smaller stage, a smaller venue, just because then it, then you know, it's that natural feeling that uh, uh, just playing music and, and having that room sound. And as far as drums are concerned, uh, I haven't stopped using the Vic Firth SD1 drumsticks. Um, Use those forever. They're kind of like a beginner's drumstick, but they're the only ones that are light enough and big enough uh, at the same time. So, um, and then as far as double pedal is concerned, I do have a Tama Speed Cobra. And then I was able to upgrade the drive shaft of that with a um, trick drum pedal drive shaft. That's made a huge difference. I don't know why they'd even sell double pedals without that style. It's like a, a cyl cylindrical, I don't know the word, cylindrical style drum shaft, uh, double bass shaft. Um, but uh, also along the lines of cymbals, um, you know, anything that has like that MB20 bronze uh, or B20 bronze is going to. Uh, Real, and I like any any crash needs to be at least over 18 inches. We're not going to be using any bullshit 14 inches or 16 inch crashes or anything like that. Bigger cymbals uh, with a lot more resonance. Yeah, and I guess in keeping with that tradition, I forgot to talk about the amps. We do use stuff from Bugera. Just we've kind of stumbled upon it naturally. We've got a 1990 that has been retuned with big old power tubes in it. So that kind of mimics the philosophy of the cymbals and even the shells on the vintage Ludwig kit that Rutgers using their, their big sizes. We've got a Bugera Veyron something or other that's meant to handle about 2000 Watts. And I think I, I also use a Sun 1200S, which has KT88s as well, big old tubes, just meant to push a lot of sound, just pumping those sound pressure levels. And uh, yeah, we love those amps cabinets that are meant to handle that kind of wattage 150 watt speakers eminent swamp things and stuff like that so just high powered stuff yeah that can take a lot of beating mm -hmm. <clears throat> um so we recorded the album in Fruitland, Idaho. It's a really small town, and we recorded at our friend Jesse Wetzel's house. He has a little recording studio that he made. Uh, it's in the middle of a goat farm, uh, so you walk outside of the recording studio, and there's literally goats and cows, and uh, it smells like shit, and the farm, and onions, uh, and it's a blast out there. Uh, Jesse is a really fun guy to work with. He's in a band called Ashes of Abaddon. 
and they play locally in Boise. It's more of a death metal, traditional thrash and death metal band. Uh, so recording with him has been really awesome. Uh, as far as the production is concerned, we're all self-produced. We really do follow like that do-it-yourself mindset. So Jesse is an old friend of ours, used to be neighbors with Chubbs. And during the recording process, you know, I wish we could say that we had way more time to record. We all have families and jobs and pets and uh, Fruitland's about an hour away. So, you know, recording the drums is like, we'll go out there and we'll spend a day or two and it's intense and we just bust through it as like as hard and fast as we can because uh, time is of the essence and so uh, we're definitely not one of those bands that have the luxury of sitting in a studio for six weeks at a time um, and really fine picking and fine tuning every little tiny thing and um, so yeah anything else on Jesse's recording studio yeah I mean I guess we just kind of had to like piece by piece it and I remember once we were like okay this is the way that the songs are gonna go I went out there and did scratch guitar and then I think a couple weeks went by or a week went by and then Rutger went out there early to set up the drums and let him acclimate and then he went out and tracked the drums and then um, I believe I went out and did my final guitar takes and then I came up with Corey and then we did the scratch or I guess the the final bass takes and then that's also when we added a lot of the the zazz the sauce to the album all of the ancillary noises and Jesse had a lot to do with that as yeah well. yeah but it was a very inspiring time I think and I really like what he was pulling out of us and he's like no let's just throw it down let's see how it sounds if you don't like it we'll take it away but there's a lot of moments that are non traditional song structure moments that I really appreciate about it and I think that that's something that I see like echoed in the Brucha catalog and I think like okay yeah we're we're in good company but yeah we just kind of had to piece it together and not really think about like you know what 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 are we doing here but really just kind of like you know like flash in the pan kind of things like what we tracked we tracked like that it came from us we know that this is our sound so we just wanted to get as much of that as possible and I think it it shows in the recording and and just yeah I mean we're we're we've been playing together in bands for a long time um well I guess this one would be the first but we're really centered in like being friends and like that is I think what sticks us together and we both are always showing each other different kinds of music and and stuff like that but you know we have fun on the shows that we've played out of town and everything like that and you know I guess that's all just rooted in all kind of being in this together so Mm -hmm. that's just kind of what what reminds me of the recording session is like yeah we weren't all able to be there at the same exact time the entire time but we were all working towards that common goal. Yeah, I someday we have a dream of, you know, it would be amazing to all sit in a studio for, I don't know, a few days all together and not have any other responsibilities or any other thing, any other things that are pressing on our uh, schedules. Uh, so maybe someday we'll have that luxury. But like Chubb says, yeah, we're not able to be there all at the same time. So we just fucking bust it out. Um, and as far as um, production is concerned we met a guy here his name is Cisco Sanchez and we had him master this second album he has a bunch of cool analog mastering equipment at his house that he ran the um, mixes yeah the mixes that Jesse gave him through that and uh, it turned out so much more powerful than we could have anticipated mastering is such an art and uh, so we really enjoyed working with cisco on that i mean we played so many local shows one one show i think of that uh you know we played with mortuary drape which is italian and uh right before all the touring bands were supposed to play the promoter of the venue 
said to them, uh, they go up to him and he, they go, oh, you know, do we have any gear uh, to use? And then he turns to me and goes, oh yeah, talk to this guy with no like pre like set up, no, as far as like any giving me a heads up or anything, asked if four different touring bands from Europe could use our gear. Uh, we ended up doing it and saving the show. It's just like those last minute things that happen in metal and punk all the fucking time that you just roll with. Um, we got to go to Salt Lake a few times. We played with the Body Void and Worm Witch down there. Uh, two really big bands now. I mean, Body Void played Roadburn. Um, they're incredible. And of course, Worm Witch just released a brand new album on Profound Lore that's amazing. I would check that out. Um, then as far as any sort of like, we, when we ever we go to Salt Lake, we've always like visited Space Jesus and any Europeans that don't know what that is, it's just like this big Mormon church headquarters where they have um, a uh, big, huge 15 foot statue of Jesus. Uh, and so we always have to go take a picture in front of that because it's just like, here's the most five crusty, metalhead dudes that uh definitely are you know not supposed to be where we're supposed to be They're very out of place uh on you know in the mormon uh, headquarters <clears throat> i do uh, i do have a funny one too, yeah so, if you got one so i yeah i love all of our salt lake trips we've been very fortunate to be able to play there play really cool venues like uh, metro music hall and stuff like that but I remember uh, one of the times we went there, and I think it was the time we were playing with Numenorian, uh, based out of Canada. We did a, uh, got done with the show, got it all set up, you know, I mean, loaded up, got all the gear back in the thing, and uh, the person who we were staying with at the time, uh, Rebecca, formerly of Sub Rosa, um, super sweet, always let us stay there. She's now in the Keening, is yeah. a, and that's a huge band. Love Rebecca. But I just remember we were all hunkering down, getting ready to go to sleep. And I think this was maybe the first time we went to Salt Lake with Corey. And we were all getting ready to go to sleep. It was all quiet. And he was like, hey, guys, who's your favorite director? And I was and from that moment on, I was like, okay, yeah, he's never not going to be in this band. But, you know, because that's just... In Just a nutshell, in the what mood. he brings to the to the table. And <laughs> Rutger and I kind of take ourselves a little bit too seriously sometimes, but Corey has always been such a good reminder that, like, hey, this is fun. Hey, we're having fun. We're hanging with our dudes. Like, let's just have some fun. And But also something so from left field, but something that definitely, I think, helped me feel closer to, to the rest of these guys. And it's always those trips out of town where you where you experience a lot of that stuff, all these little weird people you see at the rest stop and all of that stuff. That so, candy ass yeah, we saw at the rest stop. I'll never forget the rest that. Stop, so. so we just saw it. It's fun stuff. Fun stuff. It, it's, you, you know, we have a lot of you had to be there jokes. And, uh, you know, for me, for the first time in my life, I'm, he, I'm, I'm involved in you had to be there jokes. So that feels good. We're very much capable of adding hot sauce to one's breakfast burrito while driving. Yes. All you have to do is say sauce me and uh, it'll be sauce. That's for sure. Well, let me start with bucket list. Um, you know, since signing to Borussia, we have a dream of coming to Europe. I think the European fan base would really understand and enjoy what we're trying to do even more so than the reception that we get stateside uh so i'd love to go to europe that is like a big pipe dream I'd love to tour europe i've heard it's amazing for bands to tour there um so that's what i would love to do with these guys because we have a lot of fun traveling too so i like to do the tour stuff i like to see stuff um and we enjoy traveling together so that would be a lot of fun yeah yeah, I, I would say the same thing. I can't wait to play this material overseas and, and really just any any fest that feels like they need a little bit of possessive energy, we would be honored to bring it and all of that good stuff. So Yeah. Oh, uh, man, favorite gig so far? Uh, trying I, to think of one that's special. What do you... What do you... Well, I will say, so 
we mentioned Corey used to play in a band called Hummingbird of Death. He was on guitar. I believe we were opening up for either Absu or not Goat Whore, but something Goat, Arch Goat maybe. Arch Goat maybe, yeah. And um, that was the show where we saw Corey play and we were like, yeah, that dude can hold it down. And then we just kind of hit it off in the interim, like, you know, like loading out, loading in stuff. So to me, that's definitely a very important show for the history of this project because that that's when we were like, yeah, Corey, come on, come, come, come jump along and, and do this with us. And so to me, that is a favorite for that reason, because it kind of seemed to perpetuate all of what has been heard now and, and even you know on possessive one like that was all before that time i i believe and we were still just figuring out our sound there you know rutger and i as a two-piece and and we really were like okay yeah we we can bring some bass into the mix and Corey it's was exactly like, yeah. what it needed yeah yeah was that bass that low end so that was a favorite show for that reason there was like this show we played in salt lake that was really fun and it was like body void in the ditch in the delta and burn your world i think and there's just this one guy in burn your world that was like walking around air drumming the whole fucking time <laughs> and i thought it was the funniest shit because he wouldn't stop he just that dude air drummed for the whole show so props to that guy that was a really fun remember Corey stretched out my hamstrings before mm-hmm. that one I, we take care of each other yeah i need a good stretch you know um Some like Sepultura Rise was like the first album, kind of start to finish. That was uh, pretty solid. I was super into it. Um, uh, I've always been into harsh noise. Um, uh, m- you know, Mersbo. Uh, now their tongues. Yeah, now their tongues is sick. And it's and scary. <laughs> uh, but of course I love uh, the Cure, the Smiths, anything in that realm as well. Corey has. Uh, he has another project with his wife called The Street Echoes, and it's definitely more along the lines of poppy, uh, indie. It's just awesome. Corey is, like, super talented and can play the full spectrum of music from light to heavy. And I think that really brings, like, a, a unique flavor to Possessive, though, because just knowing those harmonies and knowing when it can be light and... Uh, it just really makes a, a difference, so yeah, it's sick. <clears throat> um, I was always like a, I don't know. I started out doing, listening to hardcore music too, so back in the when I was a teenager here in Boise, they had a venue. It's called the Boise Venue, and they would just had like pretty much any emo, metalcore, hardcore band would come through. So I was able to see hundreds of shows going. Uh, you know, from that, I really got into black metal though. Uh, I think like the first black metal band that really, like, kind of, I was obsessed with was Wolves in the Throne Room. Um, black Cascade, in particular, was like a very inspirational album. Uh, th- this band gets a lot of hate, and uh, some of their songs are okay, but like, I, I got to see Deaf Heaven early on. Uh, the album Sunbather in particular they played that from beginning to end and it's just like an epic band live um, good stuff yeah it's good stuff uh, the you know in, in the same vein of getting into black metal I really liked uh, Mutilation Rites it's a Brooklyn based band that drummer that left that band went on to be in um, uh, oh it's like Ulthar, and he's in uh, a couple of other really big projects. Anyway, his name is Justin Ennis, really cool guy. The 
as far as like db is concerned though i really like like the there's an italian band called the secret and they had an album called salve et coagula and that album in particular i could listen to from beginning to end super badass album lots of atmosphere really good db really good vocals another one that comes to mind is martyr dodd and they're swedish they have uh, an album that was put out on southern lord i want to say is called in extremis uh just like pure db from beginning to end um so as far as like i don't have a favorite band i just like all sorts of music and i i get inspired so like recently i've been listening to like a lot of uh spectral voice uh agriculture is another band that i've been really into um but then me and chubbs we used to <clears throat> gush over this german band called lantlos and that was like they're like shoegazy black metal um but anyway all these types of bands it's just like you know take inspiration from wherever I can get it uh, but I don't necessarily have like a favorite uh, band but I did get into listening to extreme music pretty young and it's stuck so yeah yeah, yeah you brought up a good point with Lantlos like that was kind of the one that I was thinking of just I have a hard time with the favorites band question because it really for me is kind of like well what are you just obsessed about right now and and you know once you see a band that you used to really be obsessed about you just you're like oh i'm gonna put them back onto the rotation but i started because of bands like guns and roses and metallica they really like the songs easy enough to learn you know and once you're doing that you're like yeah i can do this you know but i learned playing on my older brother's electric guitars and and so he was a very big influence as to like me getting into this more extreme stuff i mean even as far as like Blink-182, Sum 41 stuff before we really even like played instruments or anything like that. But from there it was bands like Guns N' Roses and Metallica. And he was always looking for more and more extreme. He would get into more extreme forms of thrash like Testament and Slayer, like not really that extreme, I know, right? But we are from Mexico originally, or our parents are, and when we would go and visit at all the little like open air market kind of things, there'd always be at least one guy with tons of bootlegs of the craziest extreme metal stuff like and th stuff like immortal sons of northern darkness you know gorgoroth um i don't remember the name of the album but like the one that's got sign of an open eye in it and that was the first song that i was kind of like oh okay there's something more to this extreme music because i really i hated it at first and most of the bands that i really end up liking i seem to kind of like not understand at first and, and then maybe I say hate because I don't understand him but once you listen to that enough and he was the kind of brother that would drive us to school but he'd be like I'm picking the music so I would have to be exposed to these like blast beats and these vocals and this production that, that was insane sounding and I really didn't like it at first I really was just like man this is some terrible music but after it steeped, I was kind of like, oh, okay, I'm starting to kind of see this. And then hearing a more modern band like Lantlos kind of take it to their own level with a lot of the blast beats and a lot of that extreme stuff, extreme vocals, but also moments of breath or kind of pretty stuff like that really helped me appreciate that more. Um, but so, yeah, that's how I got into any of this extreme stuff was just like older brother stuff or, you know, I'm sure maybe some of us had like a father that would play shitty classic rock on the radio and it's like okay you have to listen to that but then after a while you're like okay that's pretty cool so that's just what i how how i got into this mess i guess well i only play the drums i do not compose music at all i'd say that i'm like a I can help compose things, um, but you can, like arrange stuff. I'm good at lot. arranging, uh, yeah, but uh, definitely not a compositional guy. Um, I really like. Uh, and sorry to cut you off. No, if you were ready to rock. No, I'm gonna skip this one. 
Yeah. So when we would pick up these bootlegs, I remember one of the bootlegs was like a behemoth demonica one, and and there's a song on there called "The Oak Between the Snows" that is not by any means like a perfectly produced track, but just what is going on, what hits when it hits, like the drums and the rest of the instruments, and the guitar tone is like arguably like a terrible tone, but to me it's like perfect for like that vibe or whatever of that song and that song just like there's no words you know it's just I guess an instrumental track but it I could listen to it over and over again and it's like two minutes long and you know you listen to it and it you could be like this is you know, it sounds like a lot of other bands but I just love how that song makes me feel and I think that's why like I do any of this stuff is I just want someone to feel something anything and uh that song just for uh, a troubled boy like you know teenage boy kind of figuring out his stuff like that seemed to make sense to me and there was a lot of times where i wouldn't understand something in my life and i would just put it on and i would be like well that's okay you know because this song is here it's just you know there's there's like clean parts there's distorted parts there's like big epic drum beats it's like two minutes long um but it just it's even to this day like i i consider that one of my most favorite songs and i wish i could have written it and i think a lot of my earlier guitar parts were derivatives of that and 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 hopefully i've gotten a lot better but like they're all they all come from that song so I owe that to that behemoth song. I've decided not to actually skip this. Uh, <laughs> I was watching this movie as a kid. It's very. I don't. It's definitely not a, a good movie. Uh, called Magic Island with Zachary Ty Bryan from Home Improvement. The opening credits uh, sequence has this instrumental song by Quiet Riot. And uh, it has the coolest riffs I had ever heard at that point. So I immediately, that was a, probably one of the first songs I just learned by ear. Uh, and I still use some of those chord patterns on most of my stuff. What, what, you know, and it's, and it's on this really bad Quiet Riot uh, album. Like, not even, like, this really weird 90s album that they put out called Terrified, I guess. To me, it's it's not a good album, but there's just, uh, the very last song on this album is this six-minute uh, instrumental song that they decided to use, and it's awesome. How's our local scene? So we live in Boise, Idaho, and the scene here has grown a ton. So pre-COVID, I mean, it was pretty hit or miss whether or not you'd get a, and we possessive would get asked to play like every black metal, death metal show imaginable. <clears throat> this year we got asked to play more shows than we could ever commit to. It was nuts. Uh, every band is coming through Boise right now. Uh, it's unbelievable. I mean, there were, there's so many different, I mean, just to name a few shows that are coming up soon. I mean, you have Spectral Voice is coming. Holder is coming. Thou is coming. Uh, I like Explosions in the Sky. There's a like, super sweet, pretty instrumental band. They're coming. Boris is coming. I mean, you just these world-class, like, bands and last year we got to play with bell witch and spirit possession in the shrine ballroom it's an amazingly epic historic venue chubbs and i got to play um with yob in our other band tempestari at the egyptian theater here which is just like an epic venue huge it's as big as a movie theater it's all decked out in egyptian it decoration it is it yeah it is a movie theater it's decked out in uh, egyptian everything and it's just such a cool venue they decided to have a heavy uh band showcase there um there are so many local bands i'm just gonna like name off a few and if you guys think of just any. just to add to the scene yeah um there's definitely uh some people running running the scene pretty well um i don't know if i want to name names or not uh, 
but for the most part, you know, politics aside, uh, there's a few, few, few people that are bringing these acts to town, um, and just a wide range, like I can, there's full on harsh noise shows that I can attend as well as, you know, all, all different walks of life that seem to come through Boise, uh, Anyway, it's just to add that. I yeah, guess. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I th- I think too that this scene is actually very important and very thriving, and I think a lot of people leave because they're not received in the way that they want to be, and so they go places like Seattle or Portland or Salt Lake or something like that. But it is just kind of like I, I don't know. I think the scene here and the people that choose to stay here for whatever reason or another they're just trying that much harder to really like kind of make this thing go. Um, and I think that that just makes them go harder. It like yields very interesting things, very interesting projects. And yeah, it's easy to say, yeah, this scene sucks here. There's nothing going on here. And then just cross your arms and say, Hmm, you know, but like all the while that those people are doing that, there's two other musicians or projects behind them. Like, working on their album, working on the sound, working on what's happening. So I just think that that's super cool about it. Like more and more there's people from out of town coming here and obviously that will sustain a scene at some point. But, you know, I just want to shout out to all the people that are here that are still doing this. Like, you know who you are. You definitely have inspired me. That's why I'm still kind of doing this stuff. I, I know it's easy to go to LA or go to New York and and hit it big but it's just there's something here i don't know i i love the scene here i'm i'm so happy to be born here and to be a part of it like if it wasn't for this scene i wouldn't have met these two musicians i've spent you know i spent a year in tucson during covid and there was no there was no scene everyone was all indoors but that was easily what i missed the most was like my top collaborators and even just the people that you go out and see, you know, so yeah, you know, you know who you are, you're out there doing this thing for this scene and and it does exist and and it's cool, I think. So yeah. it's unique, it's a unique scene. It's not a cookie cutter scene. No, we got everything and I can't name a single band that I don't feel like we're uh, friends with here. Um, it's awesome in that sense, you know, there's no gatekeeping. I mean, everybody's been really receptive. Um, so let me go down some a list of bands that are around here. Uh, so one band that we play with a ton is Go Rot. Um, Chad is in that band. He used to be in Uzula, really big band. Uh, got to play Roadburn several years ago. Love, love those dudes. Elder Balu is another band. Um, Old Year is a awesome, really good. doom, noisy. Uh, core used to be in Hummingbird of Death. Hummingbird of Death is probably the biggest men's core, grindcore band Idaho's ever produced. Um, yeah, um, just some of my favorites uh, would be like Rat Champion mm-hmm. and Evils when, mm-hmm. once they start uh, playing again. Yeah. And uh, we really like the folks in Dirt Russell. Those guys are awesome. Um, they're just like a, a two-piece rock band that is just like so high energy, really fun. Um, but then there's also like cool, more artistic projects like Street Fever. Uh, it's just an amazing artistic project, uh, more along the dancey uh, and, and house and industrial lines. And then um, I'm, you know, there's I'm sure there's other bands. That, the biggest hardcore band in Idaho right now. I mean, you. I mean, you can Google that and you'll find out who that is. So, um, but yeah, this. Th- you know, the scene also like. There's a couple bands out of Portland that I really love too, and and the uh, Seattle and Olympia area. Um, so some of those would be like the Keening. I really like Asphalt right now. It's a sick DB band. Um, Holder is a awesome black traditional black metal band out of Washington. Uh, Fauna is another band that I got to see uh, not too long ago. It's like incredibly artistic. Um, 
So those are from around the area. The reason why I found out about Bruccia and the catalog of Bruccia is Sun in the Mirror. Uh, they have two albums out on Bruccia, both of which are expansive, they're atmospheric, they don't really have any boundaries to them, um, and it's just like really intensely epic music. Um, so I would definitely have to say um, Sun in the Mirror would be my first, you know, they're my first doorway into Bruccia catalog, so I'm going to mention them first. Yeah, and I also spent some time knowing Reggie and uh, Rachel, and, and they are. I just love the way that they kind of craft the soundscape. I'm just really, you know, fortunate that I got to know them. And what they do, it's so little. There's only two of them. They're really doing some pretty inspiring things. I also really found, and sorry if I butcher the name, I found uh, La Culpa to be really awesome. Just kind of the name and just kind of the the production really stood out to me and, and it mimics some of like the fury that I hope that I'm injecting into some of my music. So they were also a pretty, pretty good standout to me um, that I just really appreciated that. And Ultio was also, they also mimic Ultio, that yeah, sort sick. of like God, stabbing into stuff, but just, it's a really cool lineup. I think really diverse, but tied together at the same time. Uh, Mouth Wound was a mm, artist I haven't heard before until I was checking out the full catalog that stood out particularly to me. Uh, just really capturing and super creative and pretty inspirational. to go in my garage and lift weights. I like to call it the muscle dungeon. Uh, and I do love film quite a bit as well. I feel very one-dimensional and very boring as a human because, I, I don't know, music kind of took hold of me at a very early age and I was the middle child. And it was okay to not have friends because you had music and you had your albums. You know, I had older brothers, I had younger brothers. So I was always kind of the odd man out. And while my older brother was away, you know, practicing football, but he was the first one that had the electric guitar. Like I just started playing and like playing, you know, being kind of a loose term, but I started playing. I didn't even know what drop D was, but there's something about that and kind of you strum that thing and that sends some vibrations through you and that just kind of like took me by storm the second that I realized I could do that I just wanted to do that in wanting to be around that I decided to learn more and more about kind of the techier luthier kind of setup technician guitar tech kind of like avenues and and I just kind of have steeped in that. I've learned how to make pickups. I've worked with a local pickup maker here named Porter Pickups. And that just kind of like taught me how to fish. And, you know, there's been a lot of people in the scene and, and I feel very fortunate that people trust me with their instruments. And it just like that, I don't know, just kind of being around that stuff. Like there's not a lot of things that hold my attention the way that that does. Not a lot of, um, non-destructive things that hold my attention the way that that does but you know I also just anything I do is for my family my friends and my dogs and that is like that's it I don't know like I only go hard here because of my love of that stuff and and I guess I just felt like well if you can learn to play guitar and hold down the rhythm then you're always going to have friends and that is kind of what has driven me a lot of this way and and i'm just this far along on my journey and it hasn't let me down it's been the only constant so that's very one-dimensional and i'm just kind of 
I'll sit there and talk to you about guitars and music all day, and maybe you're like, man, I can't wait to not talk to this person because <laughs> it's all he talks about. But but I care about the people that, that I care about. Yeah. Um, and I just uh, have to give a shout out to Charles East, the Anbruccia, uh, Deerhead, Poseidon, La Culpa. These are all amazing, intense, unique artists. I'm really excited to be part of that roster. Feed them death. Um, now, as far as um, passionate about other than music, uh, similar to Chubbs, I could talk to you about drums and stuff all day if you care. Um, I cannot talk to you about like reading music or like any of that kind of stuff. Uh, but I'm very passionate about my dogs, my family. Um, and it's a very outdoor area here, so we go outdoors a lot. Um, so yeah. Oh yeah, my family too. Yeah, yeah, right. I right. should have mentioned that. I should have mentioned that. My daughter, <laughs> my wife. Yeah, these two both have beautiful young families, and like, whatever thing that I feel like, I don't know, like is missing. I just see these guys living their lives, and I'm just like, yeah, like that's such a beautiful thing, and I, I believe that it makes them both better musicians, and they just hit that much harder. So I'm just thankful that we've managed to keep this a priority and, and yeah, it's cool stuff. That's super hard. That's super hard. We're going to have uh, to... Well, I'm just going <laughs> to throw out some things that might appear on that list. Uh, some music would be like AFX Twin Selected, Ambient Works, One and Two. Uh, Bring it over here. Cool let's pumpkin. see it. Yeah, let's see this let's pumpkin. See this pumpkin. <laughs> That's such a cool pumpkin, dude. Yeah. Oh, it lights up. Cool. That's nice awesome. Nice job. Good pick. We show us that in five minutes. We'll be done in five minutes, and we'll we'll come play with the pumpkin. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Uh, one album, one film, one book. Yeah, so fit, like directors, you know, I love David Lynch. Who John, actually used John to Hughes. live oh, around yeah. the corner here yeah. from my house when he was a kid. Anyway, random. Uh, Herzog, Helen, Helen Lauder. Uh, just to name a few. I'll stop there, that way you guys can... Film, for me, I have a hard time with films. I really... Cronenberg. Uh, I had to throw Cronenberg in there. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I just was so moved by, and I think I saw it at the right time. I was kind of like a preteen kid and not really knowing what the world's about, but I know it's kind of like a very stock answer. I love The Godfather Part 1, Francis Ford Coppola. We all know him. I'm sure you guys are very familiar with his work. Um, but it just... That, I don't know, it just got to me. And there's a lot of moments where the camera's just like sitting there looking at the scenery. And there's a lot of cool cinem cinematography that is, that is occurring in that movie. And I saw it early, and so I was just like, yeah, that's my favorite, that's my favorite, that's my favorite. And obviously there's some violence, but there's the classic storyline and tale of love and deception and all of that good stuff. So that would have to probably be my film. I. It, there's just a lot that's going on there and it's a long film so you can you know do it in little bursts or or do it all at once but i feel like i could watch that thing over and over again and the music the score was also very impactful for my record player mind kind of thing so. um, i must i must say that a lot of film that i watch you know is like i definitely get inspired by the soundtracks of tangerine dream uh, Vangelis and Goblin. Uh, so soundtracks are very essential to what I kind of listen to as well. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to throw out some like movies that I like uh, and I have liked in the past few years that I saw and some series. Um, first one that came to mind was like 000 it's just about this uh, Mexican cartel and slash drug operation in Africa. It's just like an incredible short story, short series. And then uh, I also love the movie Mandy, just because Nicolas Cage is unasked in that movie. The music is good. 
Uh, the visuals are good. I love all like the the hallucination filming and stuff like that. Uh, um, so those are just like some two movies that I find fun. My guilty pleasure movie is Braveheart. I know it's like super mm. historically inaccurate, but like I love the music and the soundtrack and everything from that movie. And there's even a, a car driving in the background in one of the scenes. I know there's a car. Yeah, yeah. It's historically inaccurate. Uh, you know, and uh, there wouldn't be Christian Scotsman in 1314, but that's neither here nor there. But uh, okay, so. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to Thank you. Uh, get to know us a little bit. Check out our new album on Bruce Records, November 8th. So, uh, and, you know, support you, Bruce any way you can. They're doing free downloads right now. Uh, they're an amazing label to work with. Uh, they've been nothing but kind and just awesome. And we can't go, wait to go to Italy and uh, meet them in person. So thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you thank all. Thank you.